You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, and I am here with Carmelo Martino, and she has written an interesting book called Playing by Heart. How are you today, Carmelo? I'm doing okay. How are you, Cynthia? Can't complain. <laughs> doing very well. So, approaching my 74th birthday tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Well, happy yep. birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, would you like to open us with prayer and then we'll start with the book? Sure. Um, I'm a member of the Catholic Writers Guild and I, I like the prayer, the guild prayer. So, I will share that this evening. Mm-hmm. Holy Family, guide our minds, our hearts, our hands. As we write, speak, illustrate, help our words to live in union with the word. Teach us discipline and skill to use the talents God gives us. Give us also insight and courage to convey God's love through our craft and humility to be open to his divine will, shaping our lives in loyal, in loving loyalty to his church. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So, um, is this your first book, or no? Actually, playing by heart is my second novel. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah, so it's my more more recent novel. My first novel uh, was Rosa Sola, and it was for middle grade, uh, a little younger audience for ages ten and up. Playing by heart is for 12 or 13 and up. It's young adult. Um, mm-hmm. People who like historical fiction of any age uh, tell me that it's a, a pleasant read. <laughs> pleasant good, read. good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. And um, why did you, what led you to write it? it it's kind of a, a long story, actually. Um, I never imagined I would write a historical novel, but God had other plans. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, uh, I actually came to writing in a very roundabout way. I, my undergraduate degree is in math and computer science. Um, I loved to write as a child, and I actually was published when I was in high school. I wrote poems and an essay that were published, but I didn't think that was a very practical uh, way to make a living. So I went to school and I got a degree in math and computer science, and I worked as a programmer. And then got burned out doing that and became a database. I I started writing database training materials to teach other people how to program. And in doing that, it rekindled my love of writing. And then when my son was born, I stayed home with him. And I was a freelance writer and a stay-at-home mom. And I, I freelance. I wrote for the local Catholic diocesan paper, uh, which no longer ex- exists, sadly. Um, but I also I wrote for them for about five years. And at the same time, I wrote for some, I freelance for some national magazines like Catholic Parent and, and other publications. And so, but eventually with my, with my son, I enjoyed reading books to him. And I decided I wanted to go back to school for a degree in writing. Mm-hmm. I wanted to write again fiction. Mm-hmm. And so I got an MFA in writing, uh, specifically for writing for children and young adults, because I had a heart to write for young people. And that's where I wrote, I started writing what would eventually become my first novel, Rosa Sola, which was also a book I never intended to write that grew out of an exercise one of my teachers gave me. And it was inspired by things that happened to me as a child growing up, um, the daughter of Italian immigrants and we had a tragedy in our family and it's it's based on that experience and how God helped us through that difficulty. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I had also written some picture books and other projects while in grad school and it had a plan to try to publish one of those afterwards and none of those went anywhere. And then I saw this article, I, I came across this article about little known women of history And one of them was a female mathematician and linguist, Maria Gaetana Agnesi. And she lived in Milan in the 1700s. 
And I was appalled because I had never heard of her before. Here I had a degree in math and computer science. This woman was Italian, and my parents were always boasting about the accomplishments of Italians. And I had never heard of this woman who could have been a role model for me as I sat in classes where I was one of the few women at that time in, in my classes in college. So I was fascinated by her. Not only was she a linguist and a mathematician, but she wanted to be a nun because she had a heart to serve the poor. And uh, her, her father, and she also had a younger sister who was very accomplished, who was a musician, who became one of the first uh, women, Italian women, to write a serious opera. And the father used his two daughters to advance his place in society. So when Maria asked permission to become a nun specifically to help the poor, he said no, because it would hurt his standing in the community. He wanted to keep throwing these uh, meetings where his daughters basically performed for an audience. Um, but then he died suddenly when she was in her 30s. And she was a celebrity. And so her sister, not as much, but she wrote a math book and Pope invited her to be the first woman math professor at the University of Bologna. Wow. And she turned him down because she really wanted to help the poor. And <laughs> so um, I was just fascinated by her life and the fact that when her father died, she got a small inheritance and she used that money to help the poor and spent the rest of her life caring for the poor. She turned her back on her celebrity status, refused to, to do anything else related to that, and just devoted herself to helping the poor. So I wanted to write a book, a picture book, biography, in fact, about Maria Gaetana Agnesi to inspire young people, especially young girls who might be interested in math or who might be intimidated by math, to have a role model to show that women can be, succeed in math. And also the other things that she did that were so amazing. Um, so I did, I wrote a picture book and I sent it to the editor. Uh, my first novel, Rosa Sola, even though it is a Catholic family with Catholic themes, was published by a, a secular press, Candlewick Press. And uh, so I sent the story of Maria Gaetana Agnesi to, to the same editor and she turned it down. She said she didn't think it would have enough of an audience, but she said, maybe I could write a novel based on how the father used the two sisters to advance himself and, and the conflict that that created for the girls, because the girls were very unhappy about that. So um, so I did that. I, I wrote, I started writing a novel. I, you know, I had never, as I said, I never imagined I would write a historical novel. I do enjoy reading historical fiction. Um, and, you know, Jane Austen is one of my favorites. Uh, her books are are some of my favorite books. So I had a lot of learning to do to learn how to write a historical novel. Mm -hmm. and for good or for bad, I love research. And I think that's my freelance writing background that I, you know, I, I want to know the facts so that I can incorporate as much of what really happened into the story. Mm -hmm. So it took me a long time to write because I was trying to do research and I couldn't find information about, you know, the details of life that would make the story come alive for the reader. So then I found myself, you know, taking educated guesses. Mm -hmm. And I did find descriptions of the home, the Agnesi home, and the kind of, they had some amazing furniture and the paintings on the wall. It said there were many religious themed paintings. And so I took some real paintings in my mind to use as part of the setting in the book, because I'm a very visual writer. I have to picture the scenes to write about them. And one of the paintings um, that I picked was, I, I have to look it up. So it was uh, based on Fra Angelico's The Annunciation. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Uh, it's a beautiful painting of the angel Gabriel coming to the Blessed Mother to announce uh, that she will be the mother of our Lord. And so that was one of the pictures I imagined, or, or a picture like that. I didn't call it that in the in the story, but a picture like that was one of the paintings in the setting. And so it took me a long time. And I eventually, I tried to use as many real things as I could in the novel, but there was so much I didn't know that I eventually fictionalized it and changed the girls' names. I didn't use the real names of the two sisters that inspired it, but I, I still call the one sister Maria, and then the musician, I called her Ter Teresa. No, her real name is Teresa in real life, but I called her Amelia. And uh, 
I, I struggled with this manuscript for so long and so many times I questioned, is this what I should really be doing? And I signed up for a retreat. I'm a member of a writer's group. It's a you know, society of children's book writers and illustrators. It's not a religious group, but they had rented a Catholic retreat center. I live in Illinois and it was near Springfield, Illinois. They, they rented this retreat center and offered writing retreats. You know, people could just go for the weekend, a long weekend, and just write, or they could meet in critique groups. So I went just to write. And they assigned the rooms, and I walked into my room, and I couldn't believe it. There oh. on the wall was a painting, a reproduction of Fra Angelico's Annunciation. I knew you were going to say that. I, <laughs> I got shivers when I walked in the room. I was like, okay, Lord, this is what you want me to write. You really want me to write this because... I didn't pick that room, and that was the only room that had that picture in it. So I stuck with it, and I needed the, I needed signs like that because there were so many times that this book never happened, never might have happened. So I finally finished it, and I I I wanted feedback, so I some, I entered some contests, and it actually did quite well. It it, it won a a contest by the romance. There's a sweet romance in it. Um, so I should tell you what the story ends up being, um, the, the basic plot of the story, it's inspired by these two sisters. And so here's the summary. I wanted to read this to you. So Amelia Salvini dreams of marrying a man who loves music as she does. But in 18th century Milan, being the second sister means she'll likely be sent to a convent instead. Amelia's only hope is to prove her musical talents crucial to her father's quest for nobility. First, though, she must win over her music tutor, who, who disdains her simply for being a girl. Too late, Amelia realizes that her success could threaten not only her dreams for her future, but her sister's life. And at its core, the story is really about two teens struggling to figure out what God wants them to do and follow that calling, despite the fact that it's opposed to what their father wants for them. So <laughs> it's really a difficult situation for these girls. And um, so I had I had finished the manuscript and I had sent it to some contest. And oh, I put a sweet, it's inspired by the two sisters, but I put a sweet little romantic element in it just because it's young adult and I wanted a little of that, but it's a very pure, innocent relationship. They just, they want to, you know, she wants to find someone who loves music as she does. She's my main character, Amelia. So um, so it won a YA category of a romance and it placed in several others. And because of that, I got feedback. Several agents and editors actually read the whole novel, which is unusual to get that kind of feedback. Um, and they told me it was very well written, but that historical young adult novels are hard to sell. And so they wouldn't, I couldn't get an agent. I couldn't find a publisher. I was very discouraged. Uh, meanwhile, my first novel, Rosa Sola, went out of print, and I brought it back into print myself. I, I got my rights back, and I it had never been in paperback. They had only published it in hardcover, so I republished it in paperback with a new cover, and I also did an ebook version of it. And so I considered self-publishing playing by heart. Lots of people do that, but I felt that you know, to me, the hook of the story is the fact that it's inspired by two really amazing real women who lived in 1700 Milan. And a lot of readers wouldn't find that book unless a librarian or teacher heard about it. And for librarians and teachers to hear about it, you usually have to get reviewed in, in certain kinds of journals, you know, the school mm -hmm. library journal or, or book list or even Publishers Weekly. And if I self-published, it would be really hard to do that unless I paid for it and I wasn't going to pay the kind of money you need to pay for those kind of reviews. So I, I just put it in the drawer for a while. I thought, I thought, well, maybe, you know, the publishing industry, especially for children's and young adult runs in cycles, things are popular at different times. Well, maybe historical fiction will come around again and get popular again. So meanwhile, I, uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm a member of the Catholic Writers Guild. I think I joined back in 2014 or 2015. And in 2016, they had an online conference. So I signed up for this online conference. And I learned that um, Vince, Vince Buyer Publishing, it's not a 
religious publisher, but they were accepting pitches for novels, and they they published a lot of romance and a lot of historical. And I thought, well, I had this novel already written. Why not give it a try? So I pulled it out. I pitched it to them, and they liked it, and they ended up publishing it. Um, and I, when when I was signing the contract, I mentioned to them, you know, that I really was hoping to get reviewed. And there's no guarantee you will get reviewed, even if you have a publisher and you send to to the review journals. They have they get so many books they don't review all of them. Um, and Vinspire didn't have a very good track record of getting reviewed in these kind of journals. They're a small publisher, um, but right around that time. And again, the way God works in mysterious ways, there was, as I said before, I'm a member of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, and there was a presentation not that far from me by an editor at Booklist where he talked about some ways to make increase your chances of getting pub, getting a review published in Booklist. And one of the ways was, if you had been reviewed in, by them before, to mention that and then be more likely to review. Well, Rosa Sola was reviewed by Booklist and it actually got a starred review. So knowing that, then I made sure to tell my publisher that because the publisher has to send the book to the review journal. I couldn't do it. And I said, well, just make sure when you send it, you send it and you say, you know, that first my first novel was reviewed by them, et cetera, et cetera. And sure enough, they reviewed it and they gave it a, a nice review. And um, I felt that again was a blessing from God that it was because it was against the odds to have my book reviewed by book list <laughs> of a small press like that. And also um, Kirkus reviewed it as well. So we had a couple of nice little review excerpts. And I think that really helped because a number of libraries have bought playing by heart. And I think either because they saw the review or because I know a lot of my family and friends around the country have asked, suggested to their library to buy it. Well, a library is more likely to buy it if it has been reviewed positively in some review journal. So mm-hmm. I think that did help. So the book is out there. Um, and it and then it went on to win some nice awards. It, uh, one of them was the Catholic Arts and Letters Award. It won the 2018 uh, Catholic Arts, Arts Cala Award, they call it, C-A-L-A, um, for young adult fiction. So uh, and and some other awards. So I was very honored and very blessed. And I have an author's note in the back that talks about the real events that you know what <laughs> things in the book really did happen, and uh, what happened to the sisters that inspired the story. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's that's pretty interesting. Um, I'm a memoirist. I also have an MFA in writing. I'm I'm wondering where you went. What, I went where... to Vermont College. They have they have a low residency program um, where you just well actually they don't really have a campus anymore. But when I was there, they were in Vermont. They were in Montpelier, and um, you would go there for twelve days for the residency and then you were assigned an advisor and then you worked from home for the next five and a half months with your advisor so so it was you did you weren't on campus the whole time you were studying Mm -hmm. home so um that worked well for me so online no actually um it was by mail back in those days (laughs) we didn't even we were just starting to use email, but my my teachers, my advisors didn't um, didn't want you to email manuscripts yet. So we would actually mail our packets through the mail um, back in those oh. days. Tells you how long ago that was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how yeah. where did you go to school? Uh, Albertus Magnus for um, nonfiction. Oh, that's mm. great. Yeah, that was a few years back, and I I did that so that I could write my memoir, which uh, is pro-life, and um, haven't sold many copies, but I'm hoping that um, I'm not so much interested in selling copies as much as I am in getting the pro-life message out, 
So my mother had tried to abort me. Oh, God. And she told me when I was 11. Oh, gosh. So I wrote the book about, you know, about her telling me that and how the impact was on me and how physically um, I have some uh, issues because of the chemical she took. Um, so it wasn't, um, it was um, a book with a political reason. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I don't know if you're able or willing to speak because I know a lot of people, if you're willing to speak about it, sure, and, and get present on it, and then you can have the book available for people who want to buy the book after they've heard you talk. That might be another option for, for finding mm-hmm. books on your book. Yeah, well, yeah. The, part I, the part I didn't tell of my story um, before I went back to grad school, before I went for the MFA, I just took classes, uh, local classes, and I took an introductory class at the local community college and and uh, how to write for young people. And and then I went and got my MFA. And when I came back, I ended up teaching that class. <laughs> I became the teacher for that and other classes, and I taught writing classes at the community college for over 20 years. Mm-hmm. So, so I did that as well as, as writing. And I enjoyed teaching. I've taught, I taught mostly adults there, but I also taught some summer writing camps for kids, which was a lot of fun. I enjoyed mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Young writers too. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's certainly, you know, I think it's such an advantage to live at this time when it's so easy to find MFA programs um, as opposed to trying to figure it out through a correspondence course or through, you know, through doing research at the library. You know, so it's, it's I think, extremely helpful to be able to uh, attend courses. Right. And there's so, so much you can do remotely now that it's... Mm-hmm. Very convenient. Yeah. It is. It is. I agree. So, and it's an enjoyable. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's certainly in my case, it's an application, but um, it's an enjoyable way to try to communicate. Um, you know, with the with people who might be interested in what you're talking about. So. Mm-hmm. And I, so I created some, I have a book discussion guide, you know, like a book club guide. And I also have a teacher's guide for playing by heart that has additional activities that teachers can use to expand on what students can get out of the book. And, um, and so then I've also talked to some book clubs, either in person or remotely, um, through the internet so that's i enjoy doing that too talking about the book and the history and the research that i went through to go to create the book mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, that's good mm-hmm. so all of that's available on my website too if anybody wants to download um mm-hmm. the um the discussion guide or the teacher's guide it's all mm-hmm. all on my website mm-hmm. and what is your website it's my name, www.carmelamartino.com. Mm-hmm. I also have a separate website that I started when I was working on the biography of the mathematician because one of the things I ran into, there were a lot of myths written about her. There's a lot of stuff on the internet and even in print publications that just have untruths about her. And I created a website called mgonyesi.com where I post a lot of those myths and debunk them. Like, for example, there was a myth that said her father was a mathematician, implying that that's why she was good at math and how she learned math. But in fact, her father had never studied math. He, his family made their money from the silk business. Um, mm-hmm. And he would not have educated her probably he was enlightened i have to say that but what i think led to her getting educated was the fact that um she was the eldest child and her younger brother was getting tutored in latin and she learned latin just by eavesdropping on his lessons 
And when her father figured that out, somehow he discovered that she knew Latin better than her brother did. He let her then be tutored by the same tutor that her brother had. So normally she would not have learned Latin. And then she ended up being fluent in seven different languages by the time she was a teenager. Wow. So she was pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. And then for her sister to be a musical prodigy, I mean, all that talent in, in one family. Yeah, really, really. Hmm. So uh, what will you be working on after this? Well, I, I have gone back to that biography, um, and I'm, I finally was able to find an agent. She's actually a member of the Catholic Writers Guild, but she's a you know, regular agent with a not not a religious agency she's just a a literary agent and so she's hoping we'll be able to find a publisher for it so um good so i'm working with her on that and i've also returned my first love was actually poetry when i first started writing at age 12 or 13 i wrote poems Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and over the years i i continued to dabble in poetry i've had poems in anthologies and magazines Mm -hmm. and I'm going back. I'm back to writing more poetry. I don't think I don't know that I'll ever write another novel. It just takes too much time and energy, and I have lots of other things I want to be doing. So, but poetry still works out well, and I do still. I teach occasionally. Um, I did do a presentation for the most recent Catholic Writers Guild online conference. I gave a talk on turning life into fiction and how you take real life events, whether they're your own or those. That, of others or in history and, and fictionalize them. I actually, I used to write, I used to teach a 12 week class at that at the community college. So, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I recently taught just a, a one hour session for that too. Mm-hmm. That's good. I, I stay busy that way. You're a busy lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good to stay busy. Keeps you going. Well, and I also, you know, whatever I do, it's, it's, my hope is to serve, to serve God. And I try to follow what I feel God calling me to do. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's how I end up writing these two books that if you'd asked me, I never would have imagined I'd written either of these books. (laughs) These are not the kind of books I expected to write or to get published. Um, Mm -hmm. I I think it really was God's will. Mm-hmm. And those were just, you know, like the paintings. That was just one of a number of God coincidences that happened when I was writing, playing by her, especially. So um, I'm grateful for that. It wasn't easy. As I said, I, I struggled and almost gave up many times. So, but I can be stubborn too. <laughs> Good. That's a good thing to be, I'll tell you. If you're going to write, you need to be stubborn. <laughs> you do, because it's not an easy field, you know. To, oh, it's not. And once you get published, you know, who knows who's going to read it. I mean, you hope people will read it and find it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very true. So, yeah, that's my hope. I just hope, uh, you know, whoever, you know, that at least one child will be saved by reading my book. And that may have already happened. You don't know. You have no way yeah. of knowing. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, um, but yeah, I think sometimes that I might, um, might start writing again. It's, you know, it's, um, I work, I'm a, I work at Pontifex university, um, which is fortunately remote. They're in Atlanta. I'm in Vermont. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I, that's a full-time job. I'm married. Um, so I don't really have a lot of spare time, but I have thought about going back into it. I, I do like writing memoir. Um, you know, finding a reason for some of the things that have happened in life and, you know, hoping to help other people. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I have never taught a memoir writing class, but there is a set. So the book that I use with students on turning life into fiction is actually, there's actually a book with that title, mm-hmm. Robin Henley. And he talks a little bit about memoir writing in there and the differences between writing memoir and writing fiction. Mm-hmm. So what was that again? It was turning turning life into fiction. Uh huh. By Robin Hemley. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I might take a look at that. Um, because that's yeah. another possibility you might consider if you wanted to fictionalize some things too. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know which market is. Is it will reach more people, I guess. Or you can do both. I mean, you can have. Yep, that's you true. Can also, fictionalized stories too. Mm-hmm. But yep. as you say, you are a very busy person if you're working full time. Yeah. When I, was, when I was teaching, I wasn't teaching full time. Um, yeah. I wanted to be able to write, so mm-hmm. I taught part time and I wrote part time, and that yeah. worked well for me. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. So where in Vermont are you? Springfield. It's uh, about uh, f- maybe 40 miles from uh, the northernmost part of Massachusetts. Okay. So, yeah. And it's um, it's uh, it's considered a city by Vermont, by Vermont standards. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vermont has a, we, Vermont College was in Montpelier, which is the smallest state capital of the 50 states. So, well, you know, it doesn't take much to be a city in Vermont. That's right. You have five houses in a row. No. <laughs> and a store. But no, um, it's uh, it's a nice little place. Um, but to me, it you know, coming, I was born in Rhode Island and I've lived in Massachusetts and Connecticut. So when I came up here, it was like Wow, this is a city, and I'm it, it. The people are lovely, but um, you know, it's uh, there's a grocery store, a drug store, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, but it's the people are very nice, and they're um, they're very friendly to people who have come from other states that that have come here to live. So, yeah, so it's uh, it's okay. Yeah, the people were great when we were in, in Montpelier when I was there for school. Hmm. And, but I'm from Illinois. I grew up in Chicago, and I live in the suburbs of Chicago now. And it's pretty flat here. So Vermont takes yeah. getting used to when you're from Illinois. The hills there were oh, yeah. Yeah. kind of challenging. Um, yeah, they are. Yeah. But, um, you know, overall, it's uh, it's a peaceful, quiet um community um we do have a hospital in town which is good small but they can get you to other places if you need to go to other places by helicopter so i mean they've they've really um maximized the technology to to uh to be able to use to be able to use the technology to do things that in other places you know they just walk down the hall in the hospital, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So it's uh, nice, nice people. Um, so if you uh, continue writing, make sure you get in touch with Sebastian and uh, set up another interview. Okay, I'll do that. Um, especially mm-hmm. if, I get, if I get the biography sold, that would be mm-hmm. one. Oh, yeah. I'd be happy to share about that. And mm-hmm. if anybody wants to actually read an excerpt from Fighting by Heart, if you sign up on my website for my newsletter, you can get a, a excerpt of the novel to see if you like it or check it out, see if your local library might have it too. Mm-hmm. So. Already. That's, that's good. Um, so people have that information. They can just go to your website if they want it. You know, they anything. Mm-hmm. So that's good. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to say about the book, or no, not really. I I will give a little plug for my my first novel. As I said, it's for for ages uh, ten and up. It is 
Oh, yeah. It's, um, I said it was inspired by what happened to me as a child. It was, it's a, a tragedy, so I always tell parents this so before they decide if they want their child to read it. Um, when I was 10 years old, my mother was expecting, and my brother was stillborn. The baby died. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, the, the book was actually inspired by an exercise that one of my teachers at Vermont College gave me when she said, I, I thought well, I was working on a totally different novel, but she said she couldn't tell what the character was feeling. I knew what my character was feeling, but the feeling wasn't coming across on the page. So she gave me an exercise to write a story based on an emotion from my childhood that was still so strong that I could still feel it, a visceral feeling yeah and i wrote a short story about not the not the death of my brother but the day my mother came home from the hospital because nobody told me my mother nearly died in in childbirth she lost so much blood Mm -hmm. and i wasn't allowed to visit her in the hospital and my mother was this strong feisty little italian woman and the day she came home from the hospital she was pale, she was frail, she had to lean on my father to walk. And the emotion I wrote about was the fear I felt seeing my mother that day. I thought my mother was going to die. I literally mm-hmm. thought she was going to die. And so that I wrote a short story about that feeling and about a character who has that feeling and um, who who is angry at God when her baby brother that she had prayed for ends up being stillborn and so she stops praying and then when she sees her mother when her mother finally comes home she gets down on her knees to pray because that's all she could do and so that was a short story and it and it worked and my advisor was happy with it and I thought okay well then maybe for my thesis I'll just write a collection of short stories I liked writing the short story it was it was good it's much more manageable than writing a whole novel yeah but you, you have you have to bring your work to be workshopped. And so I had it workshopped at the next residency and they gave me some helpful feedback to make it even better. But then they're all like, well, you've got to, you've got to turn this into a novel. We want to know what happens to these people. You know, you can't just leave it like that. And that's how I ended up writing Rosa. So I took that short story and mm-hmm. it turned it into a novel. So, mm-hmm. so, and that one got, um, got recognized after I republished it in paper, well, I said it, it was it got a starred review from Booklist, which is really exciting. And then when I republished it in paperback, I submitted it to the Catholic Press Association and it won an award from them in the children's category. So, um, so I keep that in print too. That's my own uh, little book, and it still sells out there. People find it somehow and buy it. So, so that's nice. And once in a while, I get a sale. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, very good. Yeah. So, well, it's, you have a full life. Yes. And I a do. full career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I like I said, I, I consider, I actually consider myself sort of semi retired now since I'm only doing poetry and I'm not teaching that much as I was before. So, mm-hmm. I'm having a little more leisure time because I want to do some other things, but I, I can't give up. And I don't feel God wants me to completely give up the writing yet so Mm -hmm. it's god's will the uh, biography will get published and maybe i'll be talking to you again that's right (laughs) very good okay Okay. um yep would you like to close us in prayer yeah let's just close with an our father okay thank you first of all lord thank you for this time thank you for introducing me to cynthia and i hope to to listeners out there to learn more about my work that I hope is in service of you, Lord. And we close with our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Be done. Okay. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but to the rest of the Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this interview enormously. (laughs) Thank you, Cynthia. Good luck to you and your writing, too. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hello, God's beloved. 
I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.